So we'd like to uh, take this opportunity while we're just in an attitude of prayer. We have um, with us Josh and Nadine that we'd like to pray for this morning. And we've asked them to come. Josh actually called me the other day and said, hey, we've, we've got marching orders. Uh, that's not quite how he said it, but they've got a date. They're going to be leaving for the Middle East. You know, I, I hear in worship this morning, mine is saying, yes, yes, yes. And I heard the word, are we making Jesus Lord of our lives? Is he Lord of our lives? I hear what the prophet Isaiah said, here am I, send me. And I think that each one of us would have that, in, have that in our heart. But here's Josh and Nadine with two little children preparing themselves to go to the Middle East. Sounds like a really safe place to go these days, right? And yet that's where God has put upon their heart. And we've heard them share that a few times uh, in the past. So what we'd like to do is this is probably the last time we'll see them for some time. And so we want to send them off and pray for them this morning. And Josh, did you want to say anything? Just want to, uh, first off, thank you as a church for standing with us. You know, it means the world to have a, a body standing behind you. And really, it was really cool. This season has been, we get to see not even just a body, but a community because we have multiple partnering churches in this in this area and you get to see the how God is actually moving and for me it's in my hometown you know and so I'm very thankful to have people who believe in us and believe in what God is doing and it's all to see nations shaken you know and so for us um, we're almost funded very close to being funded um, but because we're so close, they have given us a date and they want us there the first week in February. It's seeming to be that the, the best flight is going to be February 2nd. So that's, we've literally wanted to call everybody and, you know, stop by all of our partnering churches. And so we're literally booked until we leave and we're very excited. And uh, we just thank each and every one of you for standing with us. Everybody has come together as a family, and for us, everybody that has partnered with us, we are truly family, and we just thank you guys, because we've seen it in our own lives, we've seen increase in our lives, and we're excited to see increase in every one of our lives, so just thank you guys. All right, thank you. Why don't you step down here, and we're going to have the elders come, and Pastor Gordy, and um, any of you that are really close to them, if you, if you feel like you want to just come stand with them, we'd like to pray over them, and our part to stand with them. And, and I'll just mention this too. If you're not on the mailing list, you can see them afterwards if you just give them your email address. And they will include you to uh, with updates of what's going on. And we would like to encourage you to do that. That way you can stay abreast. And it's just a reminder every time you get that newsletter, just to pray for them, stand with them. I think Josh and Nadine both would say they, they need uh, financial support, but more importantly, they need prayer support. They're going to... Um, I, I will never forget the story, the snake story, Josh. That, that is um, not because I like that particular aspect. I just love the aspect of trusting God in ways. But you have to step out if you're going to trust God. Step out of what's comfortable for you. So we want to pray for them. And uh, I'll just give opportunity for any of the elders that want to you just pray over them as well. Uh, we just want to pray. So, Father, today, as we see Josh and Nadine... Lord, as, as servants who have said, here am I, send me. They have said yes to you. They have counted their lives as nothing for the cause of Christ. And they don't have a second plan. This is the plan. And so as they prepare themselves to go the first week in February, Father, we want to see your will done in them, through them, that your kingdom would be furthered in the Middle East, places where others won't go. In other words, it's illegal to preach the gospel. Father, we ask that you would empower them, equip them, that you would go before them preparing their way. Father, continue to provide for them financially. Continue to provide for them spiritually. Fill their, fill their cups every day. 
Father, that it would be full and running over. Lord, wherever they go, that your word would abound in them. It wouldn't be their words, but it would be your word abounding in them. Father, we just thank you, the calling that you have put on their life. But more importantly, we thank you that they have said yes and that they're willing to go in places where others won't go. Father, we're asking for safety. We're asking that you watch and guard over them as a family. They're two little children. Father, that you would uh, just, even as, as they go into uncharted territory, Lord, that you would provide safety and refuge for them. But send them to the places, Lord, who where, the, uh, where it's the darkest. And Father, we know that many, many are coming to the Lord through visions and dreams. So Father, we ask that your kingdom would be furthered in Jesus' name, in them and through them. My daughter, my daughter. I gave you a free spirit and you married one. And it's a good thing. I've made you that way. But I see inside your heart there's fear that wants to grow. This is what the Lord said. Today I'm taking that fear from you and it will not grow. I'm putting a lid on it. I'm squashing it. And it will not be a part of you. Being that you're both free spirits, this is just a warning from the Lord. Watch out for the little ones. They'll be right with you. They'll be behind you. They'll stand with you. I'll make sure of that. But heal that heart. And don't let fear ever grow. Walk in the power and the strength and the anointing that I've placed upon you. You shall see my glory. That's a promise. Father, we pray for the journey. More than that, we ask for fruitful fields. We ask God that when they come to the place where they're going to call home for a while, maybe for a long while, that God, that there would be fertile soil among souls, O oh God, who are ready to receive and God, that there would be certain friendships that you align for them. God, I pray that there would be an openness among a few that would just create an environment of peace and of rest that they can grow as even bigger family. I pray, oh Father, that as their feet touch the ground, that they would sense your power already invested in them. And God, I pray for confirmation for them in, in every step of the way. God, let people remark about the settledness and the peace that would be their portion as they walk this road. And God, I, I just ask, oh Father, let the crowning of your spirit be ever present upon them. Let them sense it, God, in their spirit. God, every time that there seems to be something that could turn, we know where we are and we're on mission for the Most High God. I pray, oh Father, let the sweetness of your presence just overjoy and overwhelm them in ways that they have never experienced yet because they have launched into a brand new place with you. We give you praise, oh God, for who they are, but for your calling in their lives. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. This will be your checking point this is what they'll say we've been waiting for you we've been waiting for you we were looking for you and you come and so you'll hear that when you get there and they'll let you know you're at the right spot church said amen all right we bless you josh and the dean Well, hallelujah. I'm just going to pray. You can, you can be seated, but I'm just going to pray before I start speaking. So, Father, today I thank you. 
I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're amongst us. I thank you that you uh, bring everything into order. I thank you that you direct our paths and our steps. I thank you, Spirit of God, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And today, Holy Spirit, I'm giving up this vessel. That's like the worship team did. I'm I'm giving up this, these lips and this tongue and this body and you would speak through me. I pray that the words would be anointed. I pray that hearts and minds would be open today in the name of Jesus. That they would be willing to receive the word. And I thank you for it. I just pray that if there's a heart and soul in here this morning that was spoken to through worship that that would not fall on stony ground or the thorns and the thistles of this world would not come up and choke it out. But I'm praying, Father, for, for fruit. Father, we can sow that others, I pray, Father, you would raise up others to bring water, bring warmth, bring sunshine, and let this seed grow. And I thank you for this day, and I praise you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I want to thank the worship team <clears throat> for leading us into worship day. I realized this morning the sacrifice, I, I, I've known it, but the sacrifice that goes into coming early and leading worship, my wife um, doesn't drink coffee on Sunday morning, so her voice is good, and uh, I, I realize that's one of the greatest sacrifices that you can make is giving up coffee on a Sunday morning so that you can lead worship, and I did my part, I drank her coffee, so... <laughs> So, uh, I feel like maybe I had a little bit too much. <laughs> so, if I get out of hand, you, you can just calm me down. But I'm excited about the Word this morning. I hope that you are excited about the Word this morning. And Aaron, if you could, if you're still up there, there was, on one of your songs, there was a picture of a cradle with a cross on top of it. If you could just put that back up, I appreciate it. I'm going to start by reading the Word, reading a little bit of the Word, and then I'm going to preach about it. And I feel like this morning, like God was really trying to get somebody's attention. Amen. And I don't want to, I don't want to leave that. I just don't want to, I don't want to let that sit. And <clears throat> the message may, may turn a little bit. I have, I had the, the words that are hanging up here on these trees, that, that was the message, but it's really just kind of leaning towards the one word and that, or this, this one name and that is Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. And I want to cover uh, I want to cover these names, but what I, what I want to say this morning is, is I, I thought I had a message, and that message was, was from the cradle to the cross. But I'm not sure if that's the right wording for it now, but we serve a king who was king when he was born. He was king when he went to the cross, and he's still king today. Every one of us has a story. Every one of us has a life that we could also probably lay out for people where, where we were at one time we were born and, and we have a story that takes us from the cradle to the cross. And every one of us has a different story of how we came to the cross, but I want you to know something. There's life beyond just coming to the cross. There's a, there's a king, there's a prince of peace, there's, a, there's, there's, there's something called wonderful. He's a counselor, he's the mighty God, he's the everlasting father, and he is your prince of peace and you can hang to that. Amen. But there's a time in our life where I believe somebody this morning, maybe as it was spoken through the words, it needs to come to the cross. But after you recognize that there's a king that was born, there's a king that went to the cross for you and, and paid for your sins, there's a king that will give you the Holy Spirit that will lead you in every step of your life. He is the Prince of Peace. And this morning I want to cover a little bit of that, but, but I, I just thought when I saw that picture this morning, he was the king when he was born. He was the king before he was born. He was the king on the cross, and he's the king for eternity. He's on his throne. And I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 9, uh, probably up to about verse 7. And, and if, if you read Isaiah, for the first eight chapters of Isaiah, before we get to chapter 9, Isaiah was, was declaring almost, it was like a doom and gloom message to Israel. He was basically, he was prophesying about what's going to happen to Israel and, and how they're going to fall and how they're, the Assyrians are going to come in and take over and how, how they're going to be under bondage, basically. And then he says this in chapter 9 of Isaiah. 
Chapter 9, verse 1, he says, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. He's talking about Israel. As when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. This is Isaiah prophesying about 550 years before Christ was born. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelled in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and the garments rolled in blood will be used for burning in fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, comma, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. No end to his peace upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Hallelujah. We serve a king who was born. See, see when Isaiah was prophesying, there was, he, he was talking about that there's going to be gloom, there's going to be some doom and gloom in the land of Israel, but he said, but there's going to be a son coming. And you see what had to happen, he, he, calls him the, he calls himself the son of man because the son of God had to become the son of man so that the son of man could become the son of God. Yep. We are all, those who are born of the Spirit, those who are born of the blood of Jesus Christ, have the right to become the sons of God. And all of a sudden we become heirs and joint heirs of everything that Jesus Christ has. Whether it be uh, walking in the spirit, whether it be miracles, whether it be wonders, whether it be peace that we can have on this earth. We are heirs of the things of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to start with wonderful. Now, now. I told Mina this morning, she usually on a Sunday morning when I'm preaching, I'm in the office and she comes in and we pray and she, she, she wonders how it's going and I say, you know, because I never know what comes. But I said, I think I'm going to touch on all the words of Jesus Christ, but I'm really feeling like I need to talk about this Prince of Peace. So wonderful, if you look at the word wonderful, it literally means it's miracle, it's a wonder, and it's, it's something that is hard to understand. And from the time that Jesus Christ was born, he was a wonder. He was conceived uh, from a virgin. You all know this story better than I do, but he was conceived of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was full of the Holy Ghost. He actually filled another child with the Holy Spirit just uh, by the greetings of their mothers. And so from birth, he was full of the Holy Spirit, but he was a wonder. Even as a, as, as a baby, he, he, was, he was the cause. I shouldn't say the cause, but King Herod was, was afraid, and all Israel was afraid with King Herod that there was another king born, and he started killing children, and Jesus Christ was basically the cause of that. And, and Jesus, and they had to, and Joseph, through a dream, had to take Jesus Christ and flee out of the country Flee, flee from, uh, from Bethlehem and go to Egypt and then back to Nazareth. But he was a wonder from the time he was born. At, at the age of 12 years old, he astounded teachers. When he, and when he became older, he, he confounded preachers. And, and nothing that he did was normal. See, Jesus Christ came to break the mold. And I want to tell you something this morning. If you are in a church service, if you're here at River of Life for the first time, and this is just not normal, I'm glad. Because it is time that we break the mold as, as we do church. Amen. The words that came this morning, there was tongues that were given. There was interpretations that came. There was somebody who had a vision and they come up and they lay it out. I believe that all of this is the working of the Holy Spirit. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says that there's going to be tongues and interpretations in church. They should be for edification of the body and they should also be a sign for those that don't believe. 
And prophecies will come. And we had Brother John give a prophecy to somebody who's going to another land who feels that they were called by a king to go and show somebody else that this, this Prince of Peace has been here. And, and if this is something new for you, I, I just encourage you and I challenge you to check out the scripture. See, I have been told, I was told by a man one time, he said, never stand up and preach your own convictions. But what, but what I do want to do is, can preach, uh, is, is preach the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Because yeah. if we lose that in the church, I don't think it's worth it getting together. And so if you're here this morning and, and, and it didn't seem very normal to you, I'm just, I'm glad for that. It's time that we break the mold of how we do church. Because if we don't let the Holy Spirit have our service, then we're doing it in vain. With a few words, Jesus, he was this wonder, he was this miracle worker, he was this way maker that we sang about this morning, and with, with few words, he would confound the preachers. He would, he would come to the Pharisees and, and just totally nothing that they were ever used to, he would speak this out. They would come and they would try to get him like, hey, hey, uh, uh, what should we do with this money? Should we give it to God or should we give it to Caesar? And he would just, with few words, he would, he would confound them and he would astound them. And with a few words, he would, he would work miracles. These miracles that he did, according to Scripture, they could have filled a lot more books. With the things that Jesus did, but just with a few words, he would say, go home, your son is healed. He would say, Tabitha, she's not dead anymore. Tabitha, arise. He would come to her grave and he'd say, Lazarus, come forth. And just with a few words, he, he was a wonder. He was a miracle worker. And nothing about Jesus Christ was normal. And everything about him was hard to understand. He is the wonderful man that you have today. He's this wonderful Christ, this wonderful Savior. See, see, we call him Jesus Christ. Jesus was his first name. I don't know what his last name was, but Christ was actually his, uh, his title. He was Jesus the Messiah. He was Jesus the Christ. We call him Jesus Christ. His, I don't know what Joseph's last name is. I'm guessing it was Miller. Because <laughs> there's a lot of Joseph Millers. <clears throat> But he was Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, and he, and he walked this earth as wonderful, and he's still that for you today. If you need a miracle in your life today, the answer is Jesus. Amen. Now, he was the counselor. I don't know what time I got up here this morning, but I'm going to, I've got six names to get through. But counselor... See, he was a counselor as well, and, and counselor means this, and so I'm doing it a little bit different. If you guys know, usually when I preach, I have the Bible in these index cards that always fall out, so <laughs> I changed it up a little bit. Counselor means literally he's the giver of counsel, and he's your advisor. I want to tell you this. I believe that there are many men and women who are trained counselors. We need that on this earth. We need counselors. We need human uh, men and women who can bring counsel, who can bring advice, who have, who have lived a life that we have and who have more experience uh, than we have. And, and as sometimes I, I look at older men and I just ask them, how, how should I be raising children? And they don't know either. <laughs> and I am starting to learn that it is all by trial and error. Raising kids is all by trial and error. Pretty much experience. But we have this counselor who was born in the cradle and even as he walked this earth he would give counsel with few words but now he is the counselor and that counselor to me is the Holy Spirit in my life. The counselor knows your thoughts and he knows the intents of your heart. It is a, it is a uh, humbling thing to know that the Savior that we serve knows what you're thinking. He knows what you thought through this church service. To me, sometimes that is a humbling thing. But I also know that He knows the intents of my heart. Amen. And I thank God that He judges me according to my heart. Because I live, I, this flesh house is just like the Apostle Paul says. He says, man, I'll tell you what, the things that I really want to do, I don't get done. Or the things I don't want to do, this I do. But I thank God. I thank God through the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness, for grace, for mercy, for love. The, 
the counselor brings correction. Now, now I want to, I want to be very careful here. The Holy Spirit to me is not only, not only the grace in my life, not only the power of God in my life to help me walk through every situation that I get confronted with. This counselor brings conviction in my life. And, and I can tell you right now, I can tell you right now, even from experience, just in my own household, that, that I might have a conviction in my life that, that maybe my wife doesn't or my children don't, and I can try to shove it down their throat, but the best thing that you can do is if you have a conviction in your life, it's to show others how you really feel about it. You need to live out your conviction. You see, I can't just shove just because there's something that convicts me. I can't shove it down your throat. I can't make you believe what I believe, but I can show you what I believe. And sometimes we get this conviction mixed up with condemnation. We, 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 we become, and even, even just uh, up here preaching today, I get worried sometimes that, that, I, that I throw out condemnation at you, but I want it to be uh, just, just words of the Holy Spirit so that I would bring conviction in your life. And that conviction of the Holy Spirit, sometimes we get it mixed up with condemnation where we say, that's just condemnation from the devil. I'm not going to receive it. Sometimes it may be conviction of the Holy Spirit. He's the counselor in your life. You see, you can have that counselor even now. He was born, like Isaiah said, he was born a counselor. He'll always be a counselor. He is the mighty God. I'm telling you, when Isaiah was given this prophecy, if you would read the prophecy back in that day, you would be going, yes! We have a warrior coming. He's going to roll. The, uh, he's going to take the sandals of all the dead warriors. He's going to roll their garments in blood. We're going to throw it on the fire. There's going to be a great awakening. I'm telling you, there's a king coming. There's a warrior coming. He's, gonna, he's just going to release us from all this bondage. And I read the prophecy of Isaiah and I'm going, where is the mighty, where was the mighty God when Jesus walked on this earth? Where was the warrior when Jesus walked on this earth? You see, even his disciples believed, even the sons of thunder believed, even the sons of Zebedee believed, that their mother believed, that said, man, when you come into your kingdom, I want my two boys, to, one on one side and one on the other side. And he said, you don't understand what you're asking for. Yep. You want to be on one side of me, you're going to be hanging on a cross. Is that the mighty warrior? Is that the mighty God? Is that, is that the, the king that we were looking for? I thought he was going to come and release us from this Roman rule. I thought he was going to come and fight all of our battles. It took a warrior. It took a warrior to stand and take all the sins of the world. There is no other man on this, uh, in, on this earth that could have stood and taken the sins and the shame and the guilt of this whole world upon his shoulders and take it to the cross. Amen. It took a warrior. And he's still that warrior today. He's still here to fight your battles. He is the mighty God. Jesus knew what his calling was. You see, sometimes, sometimes we... I hear a lot of message about, messages about destiny. Well, what is our destiny? You see, I, I think of a brother, I think of my brother Roger Bontrager who can't be here today and, I, and I'm going, what Roger probably has to be asking right now, what is my destiny? What am I called to this earth for? See, I, I don't think I just came to fight this battle, to fight this sickness and then just die. But Jesus knew what his calling was. See, he knew that his destiny was eternal life. He knew that his destiny was sitting on the throne by the Father. But he also knew that his calling was going to the cross for the sins of the world. And it says that he, he took that calling and, and he, he fulfilled it with joy. He fulfilled his calling with joy. But he knew that his destiny was eternal life. I believe many of us in here, uh, we've heard it said that, you know, God never said, I just want you to be happy. God never said that, I just, I just want you to have things or pleasures of life. He does want us to have joy. Amen. We can walk through hell on this earth. We can walk, uh, uh, you know, uh, through every valley and, and, and across every mountain on this earth, and we can do it with joy. I do believe God wants us to have joy in our life. I do believe that God gives the increase. I do believe that God brings prosperity. 
But sometimes we, we fall into dark places in our life and we're going, I'm not quite sure if this is my destiny. I don't know, even know what my destiny is. Your destiny is if you are born of the Spirit of God, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your destiny is eternal life. Your destiny is praising God for eternity. What your calling is on this earth, sometimes it takes a walk to figure it out. I will never forget, I will never forget when I was still Amish living up in Shipshawana and my wife can tell you, uh, we were getting ready uh, to go to a uh, um, Gospel Echoes ministry banquet down at Essen House and a lady knocked on our door. She was a van driver. She had uh, driven us a few times. I had known her a little bit, but she knocked on our door and she said, I don't know why, but God told me to come here and I don't know wh wh what's going on here, but I see you standing behind the pulpit. <laughs> and at that time, at that time, I, well, I'm not behind the pulpit, am I? And at that time, uh, <laughs> I had to wonder just how in the world is this possible? There is no way there is no way that this is possible, but I was open to the Spirit of God. I was born again, and I knew that if God called me, and if, and if God would lead me to it, and, I'm, and if, if I was open to it, He would fulfill it. Amen. See, it's not up to you always to just fulfill your calling. It's up to God to, to, to fulfill the calling. It's up to you to be available. Amen. Every one of us has a calling on this life. Some of us might go to the Middle East uh, to, go, to go preach the gospel. Some of us might be called to, to fill the streets here and preach the gospel. Some of us might be called uh, to, to, to pastor a church. Not all of our callings are, are the same, and sometimes we get caught up in this thing. Well, uh, I look at other Christians, and I'm going, uh, why can they, they do that, but I can't do this? And what happens in our mind is, is it almost doesn't seem fair. Why can they be retired and travel and do this? And I can't do that because I was called to this. Yep. Well, I'm just telling you now, life isn't fair. Because if life was fair, Jesus Christ wouldn't have had to die for you. Amen. That was maybe too straightforward. <laughs> <clears throat> Jesus came... He, was, he came full of grace and truth. He came with the sword and, and, and the shield. And Jesus Christ also taught us how to fight like a warrior. See, see I look at Jesus and I'm going, he never, this warrior. He, sometimes the stuff that he said, I just don't, can't, couldn't quite figure out when, he, when he, they were done up, the, up in the upper room. And he said, it's my time, it's time to go. And, and, Je, uh, and Peter one of the disciples said, hey, uh, we have a sword. We have two swords. Is that enough? And Jesus said, yes, it's enough. Bring them. And so they take the two swords, and then, and then here comes the multitude to take Jesus to hang him on the cross. And, and Peter decides it's, it's time to use the sword. And, and he knocks the, the high priest's servant, he knocks his ear off. And Jesus said, hey, put that thing away. And Jesus shows us how to fight like a warrior. He says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Amen. You see, you see, he shows us how to fight like a warrior. There are many, many times in my life when I'm confronted by other humans, when I'm confronted by family, when I'm confronted by religious leaders, where I would, I would really like to throw a punch or two, or three. But he shows us, he says that the weapons of your warfare, they're not carnal. You're not going to win any battles with physical fight. He shows us how a warrior should react. And that warrior stood in the middle of Pilate's court. I find this amazing that the man, that this man who created the earth, that this mighty God who created the, the earth, who walked on the earth, who came as a baby boy, he created the very tree that he hung on. He could have stood in Pilate's court and with a few words he could have wiped them all out. But he was your warrior, he was my warrior, he was your mighty God, he was my mighty God, and he took the sins of the world upon him so that me and you could have eternal life. And I want to say something this morning, I don't know, I don't know who the Holy Spirit has been talking to, but, but I, 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 it came to my mind this morning, I thought, man, that really doesn't go with the message. But I, but I, I looked it up, and, and in, in 1833... In the year of 1833, when Andrew Jackson was president of the United States, there was a man by the name of George Wilson 
who robbed a mail carrier, the U.S. mail. And he was arrested, and, 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 and they said that your sentence for, for putting this mail carrier's life in danger, you put his life in jeopardy, your sentence for this is going to be, you're going to hang on the noose. You're going to hang. And through, through pleading of his friends and family, they came to the president, Andrew Jackson, and, and through the pleading and through the words of his, uh, the ones that loved him and knew him, Andrew Jackson said, I will pardon this man. And so a president could pardon a man and basically what he could say is you are pardoned this sin that you did or this, uh, uh, th this, this crime that is, that is against you, that they are bringing against you, is wiped away. Your slate is clean. For some reason, I don't know why, but for some reason, George Wilson, George Wilson did not accept the pardon of Andrew Jackson. I wrote this down. The court, it, it, when I looked it up, it's on Wikipedia, by the way. Everything on Wikipedia is true. <clears throat> they had a judge marshal. They, they had uh, others that were in there. The names of them were all in there. But here's what they, they came up with. They said, we declare that a pardon is a deed to the validity validity of which delivery is essential and delivery is not complete without acceptance it may be rejected by the person to whom it is tendered and if it is rejected we have discovered no power in this court to force it upon him you see when the king when the king came in that cradle the world, most of, most of the people or most of the world that knew the scriptures and even the disciples thought that this was the king that was going to wipe out Roman rule. This was the king that was going to fight our physical battles. And what they later discovered was that this is the king that came to pay for the sins of the world so that you and me could be pardoned from our crime and from our sin. But there is something that is up to you now. There's, there's, there's something that is up to you and this pardon that has been delivered will not be valid unless you accept the delivery. But if you accept this delivery, if you accept this pardon, your slate will be wiped clean. Just like Becca said this morning, these ashes will be, will be traded for beauty. The ashes of your past can be traded for beauty and it will be nice and lush and green because of the pardon of Jesus Christ. And I just want to, I just want to, uh, uh, um, how do I want to say, encourage you this morning that you can accept the, the gift of Christmas. Every one of us has a Christmas in our life if we have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. There is a birthday in our life when we receive the Savior as our, Jesus Christ is our Savior. Every one of us has a Christmas. And the day I want to, I want to encourage you that you can accept this Chris, this Christmas gift. You can accept this pardon. It will not be valid unless you say it is mine. It will not be valid. You can have it. And I'm telling you, there's, there's religion that will come against you. There are lies. There are people that will tell you, well, you need to do this and this and this plus Jesus Christ. Or you need to do this and this and this plus the cross. It is a lie of the devil. Because if you receive that pardon, your slate will be wiped clean. And then we get mixed up and, well, I just need to do enough good works. Or my sins were bad enough that if I can just do enough good works, I could get back into the will of the Father. I, I could get back into the grace of the Father. No, I'm telling you, first you need to accept the pardon. And then you will do the works of righteousness. If you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, if you believe that the Holy Spirit is for you in your life today, you will walk it out on this earth and you will do the works of righteousness. You don't have to do the works of righteousness. You can't do enough good works. You cannot do enough good works. If you say that if my works plus Jesus on the cross will be enough, then you are deceived. Bottom line. All right, we come to the Prince of Peace, and I'm going to ask Aaron to put that. I asked Aaron to uh, write something out. By the way, he can, Aaron can type without looking. Right. Isn't that, amazing? that was amazing to me this morning. I was telling him what I would like, and Aaron was looking at and typing. And if I type, it's like boop, 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 <laughs> like that, and I have to look. <clears throat> Nobody's fault but mine, but that's why I write stuff down. <laughs> 
He is our Prince of Peace. He is our Prince of Shalom. Peace is shalom. Jesus Christ came. It's like, it's like uh, Isaiah said, this is the Prince of Peace. He is the Master of Peace. He is the Chief of Peace. And when, when the angels came singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Shalom. And this is right here, this is the Thayer definition. I have Thayer and Strong's, in it, but the Thayer usually lays it out, but your Christian peace is this, the tranquil state of a soul, assured of its salvation through Christ, and so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever that is. And the reason I feel like God was leading me to this this morning is there are some people in here, there are many people in this world who are not in a tranquil state of mind. And that tranquil means it is free from disturbance. That tranquil state of mind means that it is free from disturbance. It is free from the clutter of this world. And there are many minds who have been caught up in a lie. There are many minds who are caught up with, with current events. There are many minds who are caught up with what Christmas actually is. And what it does, actually sometimes we come into this Christmas season and it clutters our minds so much because uh, financially it doesn't, it's not going to work. Or with family it's not going to work. Or with children it's not going to work. And we get this cluttered mind and the whole reason for Christmas is just basically thrown out the door. But I want you to know this morning that if you, if you believe that Jesus Christ is your Prince of Peace, if you believe that you have, an, and, and when, when I say that a tranquil state of mind, I believe it's very simply this. You have an assurance of salvation. If you know that I am saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and you know that nothing can come and take that away, I'm telling you, the devil will come and he'll throw every lie at you. He'll throw, he'll throw the kitchen sink at you to get you to believe that you are not saved. And if he can get you to believe that you are not saved then you will not be at peace. But there's a prince of peace who was born in the cradle. There's a prince of peace who walked on this earth. There's a prince of peace who died on the cross. And now there's a prince of peace who sits on the throne and he says, if this world would just have my peace. There's a tranquil state of mind that you can be in. I don't care if you're sick. I don't care if you're walking through hell. I don't care if you're rejected by family. There's a tranquil state of mind that you can have knowing that there's a, there's a peace. See, sometimes the, 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 the Greek word for peace is irony. And sometimes I, I feel like, man, just a little bit of peace and where, where what I would really like to do is just take me and my wife and we would go far away and we would get a motel room and we would sit by the pool and we would be on a lawn chair and we would drink and uh, not drink, drink, but we would drink Kool-Aid and we would just be away. Man, that didn't come out right. Come on now. <clears throat> We need an altar call. <clears throat> but if we could get away, if we can just get away from the clutter of this world, if we can just get away from, from the trials of life, if we can just get away from raising children, if we can just get away from, from working our job and providing and all of this stuff, maybe I would have peace. Peace. But I'm telling you the peace of God is when you can have an assurance of salvation, when you can walk in, in, in a tranquil state of mind through the middle of hell, knowing that everything is fine and dandy because I serve the Prince of Peace, and I know that when I'm done on this earth, my lot in life will be uh, worshiping the one on the throne forever and ever, Amen. for everlasting life. Amen. Monday night, Monday night, Lowell, I, don't, I didn't know how this is going to come out, but Monday night I was laying on the couch. I, I had just found out I was going to preach, and I got the Bible, and I was reading. And then I closed it, and I, I just closed my eyes, and I saw, this is for you and Rita, but I saw somebody in the storm of life. There was a, there was a uh, snowstorm, a blizzard. You could barely see but I saw somebody just huddling up their coat. They just pulled their hood up. They huddled, they pulled their coat tighter and they turned their back and they just walked into the storm. And I want you to know, I want you to be encouraged this morning, but I saw you and Rita. 
And there are days where it seems like you're just walking backwards. And the storm of life and the blizzard of life is going to take you out. But there are days where you feel like you're walking backwards. But know this, you're pushing into the kingdom of darkness. You, you are advancing the kingdom of God. And I want you to know, if I could say it publicly, I want to give all honor and glory to God. But if I could say as a, as a friend to another friend, well done. Well done. You brought life to somebody who didn't have life because of obedience. And you advanced the kingdom of God. You worship a prince of peace. You worship... A Savior because you know that I have an assurance of salvation and, and, and sometimes this assurance of salvation will drive us to another country so that others can have assurance of salvation. Sometimes this Prince of Peace will drive us to the streets. Sometimes this Prince of Peace will take us to the neighbor. Sometimes this Prince of Peace will, will take you to the one who are you, you're working beside every day who do not have the assurance of salvation because you just can't stand that somebody else doesn't know that your eternity hangs in the balance. But I could say this morning, it is, sometimes it boggles my mind. Sometimes I, I can't get, stop thinking about it, how that if, if just by accepting the pardon or not, your eternity is decided. Amen. Isn't that crazy? If you accept the pardon, your eternity is decided. I, I had a man tell me one time, he said, you know, you only have one choice in this life. You only have one choice in this life. That choice is Jesus Christ because everything else is going to come automatically. Hell will come automatically. Death will come automatically. But if you accept Jesus Christ, if you accept this pardon that He delivered to you, it, is all, it all hinges on your acceptance of the delivery. Religion will tell you it's not enough. Jesus Christ says, I paid for it. I paid for it. It's done. And he sits on the throne. And today, this Jesus Christ, he is your Prince of Peace. He is your Prince of Peace. There's a, there's a scripture. You see, Jesus, Jesus came and he, he, he told the disciples, he said, I'm just going to, um, in Luke 12, 51, Jesus says, do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you not at all, but rather division. And you're going, well, what, what was this with the angels coming and saying, peace on the earth, goodwill towards men? What, what, is he contradicting himself when he says that I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring division? You see, he says that a household is going to be divided against household. Mother and father are, are going to be divided against their children. And brothers and sisters, and I look at the life of Jesus Christ, and I look at his brothers, and it even brought division to his household because he walked in the Spirit of God, and it brought division where it says that his brothers did not believe in him. He said, I, I came to bring a sword. I came with a sword because I'm bringing division. And this division is this. There are many people who today are riding on the fence. Many people today who are not sure if they want to be a Christian or not a Christian because I'm telling you, in this life, you will have trouble. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. Right. But be of good cheer because I have overcome. But sometimes the trials, sometimes the thorns of this life will take over and you're going, I just do not think that it is worth it. And I have been, I, I'm guilty of this myself, or, or I had something that I really needed to press into, I had something that I really need to pray about, I have something that I really need to fast about, but you know what? I'm not sure I'm going to do it because I've done it before and it didn't work and I'm afraid the devil's going to hear me and it'll get worse. That's my human nature. But then I have to coach myself and I can say that no, <laughs> not today, devil. I am a child of the Most High. I serve the Prince of Peace. I serve the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. I serve the Counselor. Amen. I serve one who is called Wonderful and he will walk me through everything that I need to walk through on this earth. Amen. Until my calling is fulfilled and I know my destiny. I'm going to go to a little bit of scripture before we get to the last song. 
the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ and so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever that is. I want to read John. I'm going to go to John uh, chapter 14. John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 25. Jesus is talking about the gift of peace. He says, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance the things that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. He says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. He says, my peace I leave to you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. I'm not giving you the peace of the world. See, the peace of the world thinks that it is just the absence of conflict. It is not the absence of conflict that brings peace, but the presence of God. Just because there is an absence of conflict doesn't mean that you will have peace in your heart. You see, when Jesus, the disciples, and, and Mark, I, I believe it's chapter 4 and 5, where Jesus is talking about, uh, or where, where Jesus and the disciples, they get on a boat, and it says, and many other little boats with him, and they, they're going to sail across the Sea of Galilee at night. And it says, a great tempest, a great tempest arose against them, and waves came in, they started filling the boat. And the disciples woke up, woke Jesus up, and they said, do you not care that we're dying? Do you not care, Master? Do you not care that we're about to die? And Jesus stood up. And he said, peace. Be still. And immediately these waves lay flat. But this is actually a different word. It's not the same word as, as Irene. This peace that Jesus said basically means shut up. <laughs> That's what it means. Shut up. And be still, uh, the word means muzzled, like, an, like muzzling a dog. And you see, every one of us at a certain time of our life, and, 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 and many of us are, might be in a good place in our life, but some of us are walking through a time in our life where these waves are coming up and they're pounding against the boat and we're wondering if our Savior is still asleep. But there is a mighty God, there's an everlasting Father, there's a warrior who has the power to stand up and say, shut up. He will quell every other voice that is coming against you. See, the devil has been given opportunity. He says in Revelation, in Revelation, I believe it's in chapter 6, where he says, where Jesus opens up this second scroll, and there's one coming out riding on a red horse, and it says that he was given the power to rob peace from the earth. These are the lies of the devil. These are the lies of the enemy, and he has come to rob your peace from you. But Jesus has the power to stand up on that boat and say, shut up, no more. There's going to come a day. I don't care if you're Democrat. I don't care if you're Republican. I don't care if you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. I don't care if you mask up or if you don't mask up. There's going to come a day where this Prince of Peace is going to come back riding on a white horse, eyes flaming with fire with a sword sticking out of his mouth, and he will judge. And us Christians, we get caught up in petty arguments. We get caught up in, in these silly, silly little fights where we can't get along because of, of something that somebody said or because of a doctrine that has nothing to do with the Word of God. And we get caught up in these petty little arguments and we forget. We forget about the peace of God. We forget about the tranquil state of mind. We, we forget about the assurance of salvation. And if, um, it's like, uh, I think it was Max Licato said, if the Christians, if the Christians fight, they'll fall apart, but if they fish, they'll flourish. 
We need to fish. I'm going to read a little bit of scripture. If the worship team wants to come up, that would be great. John chapter 16. See, the peace of this world is just temporal. The peace of this world is so temporal. In one place, Jesus will tell you that your life on this earth is like the steam coming out of a tea kettle. It's there, then it's gone. And what we do on this earth, what we do in, in this life will determine our eternity, where we spend eternity with the everlasting Father. Goodwill, when, when he came and when the angels came and they said, peace on the earth and goodwill towards men, that goodwill means there is a satisfaction and a purpose. See, there's a tranquil state of mind as we fulfill our purpose. There is satisfaction in fulfilling your calling. There is a satisfaction in fulfilling your calling. See, my wife, the, the worship team, I, I just want to tell you that if you don't want to give up coffee on a Sunday morning, you better learn how to play an instrument. <laughs> but, but if my wife decided that, you know what, I don't want to give up coffee, I don't want to be on the worship team anymore, her satisfaction and her, her, her tranquil state of mind would diminish because she's not being fulfilled in her calling. John chapter 16, I'm going to uh, read a little bit yet, and then we're going to worship. Verse 31. I'm going to start in 29. His disciples said to him, See now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them and said, Do you now believe? Indeed the hour is coming. Yes, and has now come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I'm going to leave it at that. I, I, I believe I had a lot of notes. I believe this message is fulfilled. There's one thing I can't leave set. And that is the words that came this morning. I can't leave it. So we're going to sing. And if that is still you, if God has been working on your heart throughout this service, if you want to know where you're going to spend eternity, you can have that today. You can have that peace. You can have that tranquil state of mind, knowing, knowing where you'll be for eternity. You can have that. And if that was you this morning, I don't know. I'm just putting it out there. If that was you, I'd like you to come forward. And if also, if, if, uh, if you feel like something has been robbing you of your peace, and you just want to get back to the heart of the Father, and you want prayer, we have pastors, we have elders, we have ladies that, and men that would like to pray with you, I welcome you to come forward if you want prayer and spend time at the altar. But this morning we're gonna we're going to worship and pray. But first we have a word from Sister Dawn. Did not I say in my word that it's easy for me to say thy sins be forgiven? I do not want people in the world carrying their sins walking here walking there day after day after day after day with sin because it weighs you down it weighs you down it weighs you down it weighs 
let you down. I want people to come to me. I long for people to come to me because I want to say to each one of them that I created, I want to look them in the eye and say, Thy sins be forgiven. I didn't say sin. I said sins. It doesn't matter how many. It doesn't matter to me because I want to say thy sins be forgiven. Amen. Thank you. Church, if you want to stand, we're going to sing Jesus Messiah.